Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my 100% walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for Nintendo Wii. In the last video, we completed the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero, and now that we've done that, we now have access to two different side quests that we can complete to get the final prizes from Batro. So I'm going to be doing that in this video, and then we're moving on to Lanayru in the next video. One of the odd things about these two side quests is both of them are actually available after the second Imprison Battle, and just before you go to Thunderhead. So you can actually do it before you go to Thunderhead, and otherwise you have to do it after the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero. So it's kind of weird, it depends on when you want to do it. Um, I wanted to put it here because I wanted to keep all of the Thunderhead and Light Tower and Scrapper stuff all in the same like couple videos. So I wanted to keep that all just main storyline stuff. So I have this video just dedicated to side quests. That's why I'm doing it in that order. I debated about showing this earlier in the walkthrough, but I figured it made more sense to do it now because now everybody has it available and there's no chance that they can't do it, you know? I just felt like it made more sense that way. Anyways, this first step is optional. You don't actually have to do this. If you go to the bazaar, you get a clue about where to go next because Sparrow is missing, who is the fortune teller dude, and he's not in his little booth anymore. And so meanwhile, there's one of the dudes that is hanging out in the kitchen area and he has a chat bubble above his head. If you speak with him, you'll get an optional clue where he says that Spirit's crystal ball is broken. And he finds that kind of funny because Spirit didn't see that coming. Now Spirit's house is in the bottom right corner of Skyloft in the residential district and it's you follow the upper middle path and then go under the bridge. And it's basically just underneath where the windmill propeller is for that one tower that leads to opening the light tower. So that is how you find that. So it's a little bit tricky because it's not an as obvious a place as a lot of the other uh, buildings in Skyloft. Ninja building. So the previous step was optional. You didn't actually have to talk to the dude in the bazaar, but now this part is required. You go speak with Spirit, and you can see him all bummed out because of his crystal ball. So Spirit told us that apparently he got his first crystal ball from somewhere below the clouds, and in fact, Scrapper is the one who brought it to him, and he just picked it up sometime and brought it to Skyloft, and then and then uh, Spirit has been using it ever since. So, which is kind of weird, you'd think at this point we could just ask Scrapper to go get another one, or ask him where he found it, but we don't actually have that option, which is kind of weird. So instead you want to hop off one of the docks and then fly over to Elden. And again, you can only do this either before starting the Song of the Hero, so after the second Imprisoned Battle, but before you go to Thunderhead uh, with the giant pumpkin soup vat or after completing the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero. So once you arrive in Elden, you want to just use the bird statue that is labeled as Temple Entrance. This will take us to just outside the Earth Temple, and if you douse from here, you'll see that the Crystal Ball is actually part of the architecture of the Earth Temple itself. If you look off to the right, you'll actually see a broken pedestal, which is where the original Crystal Ball came from. So this is where Scrapper got it from. To get to the Crystal Ball on the left, what you want to do is just step into the Air Geyser off to the left, which will bring you to an upper ledge. There's also a uh, gossip or a goddess cube there that we got much earlier in the game. So if you haven't gotten that yet, be sure to blow up this nearby cracked blocks with bombs and then grab that gossip that goddess cube. There's also a gossip stone here, which you can then play the harp for the butterflies here to make that appear, which I also did earlier. So be sure to grab that treasure, then use the claw shots on the target across the way to get over to the crystal ball. Then inspect it to have Scrapper come and grab it. You know, it's kind of a shame. We're just like further destroying this this temple, you know, sacrilegious. It's horrible. But you know what? This is an adventure game and I don't have time to sit around and wait for this. No way. We need to go like just file more temples and like temple dive more and get all their artifacts and stuff like that's what we do. <laughs> it's kind of the very definition of a Zelda game, really. Why are all these temples filled with puzzles? Why? It's self-defense, of course. They're just trying to keep people from taking their treasures away. I guess we're actually a magma at heart. I laugh at your attempt to preserve your technology. I will take it all. Buddy. 
After the master short pants comedy routine, you want to return to Skyloft and go back to Sparrow's house in the bottom right corner of Skyloft. So once you've finished helping him, he will give you another five gratitude crystals. There's only one more quest left. And again, you could have done this one much earlier. You could have either done it before or after the second in prison battle, but before going to Thunderhead to confront Levias, or you have to do it after the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero. So I'm doing it at this point in the game. And what we need to do first is we need to return to uh, Pumpkin Landing and speak with Keena there. All right, so in order to complete this next side, or have this side quest be available, you do have to complete the other side quest right before this, which is repairing the chandelier in the Lumpy Pumpkin. So in order to do so, you have to have all those other events already completed, which are breaking the chandelier by rolling into the railing of the upstairs area of Pumpkin Landing, and then speaking with Pum, the pumpkin shop owner, to deliver pumpkin soup to Aegis in the training hall in Skyloft. And then you need to help Kina deliver pumpkins, where she's like moving back and forth, this little mini game thing. And then you have to play the harp with Kino, which is definitely the hardest task of those. So after you've completed all those things and gotten those harp pieces, you will be able to see this quest after, again, either after the second imprisoned battle or after the second or the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero. So those are the requirements. I will try to remember to place some links to the related YouTube videos and put them in the description of this video. So if you are watching this at this point and you haven't completed those things, I will give you links to the videos that are related to that in my walkthrough and the timestamps or whatever so that you can go right to the point you're missing so you can complete that. So, once you have all those things done, and it's either after the second in prison battle or after the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero, this quest is finally available. <clears throat> so speak with Kina here on Pumpkin Landing, and she has a chat bulb above her head. She is looking for somebody who can help her hoe the pumpkin patch to get it ready for the next planting, and she's feeling lazy. She doesn't really want to do it, so she's hoping that you can find somebody who can do her dirty work for her. See what I did there? Now, one other comment about this real quick before we move on, just a note, is both of these side quests that I'm doing in this video, you could have actually gotten the dowsing option for them, that first step. You could have done that before we ever went to Elden for the Song of the Hero. So as you were completing the Elden portion of the Song of the Hero, you could have then uh, spoken with the correct person or done the correct object to uh, complete that portion of the side quest. So you could have like been completing a side quest simultaneously while doing the main quest. Um, I didn't do it that way and I separated it into a completely different video because I felt like it was less confusing that way. I don't like to like I try not to refer people to previous videos like like you know what I mean they're at a video and they're trying to figure out what to do here and they're like oh no I have to refer to multiple previous videos just to find the other steps of this side quest and I try to avoid that as much as possible and just make it super clean cut like all together. But yeah, if I'm, what I'm saying is that you could have spoken with either one of those people before you ever went to Elden, you could have been doing those simultaneously, and it would have saved you a little bit more time. It's a little bit more efficient that way. Uh, but again, I didn't do it that way because I didn't want to cause any more confusion. So once you arrive in Elden, you want to use the Volcano East bird statue, which is definitely the one that brings you the closest to our goal. Now, when you land there, you can douse if you like, and this will lead us to the volcano in the lower portions of the Elden province. So from here, you can then jump into the volcano by using the nearby air geysers, and then you can dive down to land on top of one of the pillars where there is a magma that we've seen earlier in the Fire Sanctuary. Now, this magma is named Gold, and he is the old bro who helped us in the Fire Sanctuary. He had a clue about how to find the, uh, I think it's called the Mysterious Crystals, actually, but the boss key, basically. He gave us a clue about how to find the boss key within Fire Sanctuary, and that's where this guy came from. So, he is now hanging out here. He's the magma boss, and he doesn't really want to be an Elden anymore. He's just kind of sick of this hot, oppressive of air and he wishes there was some place he could go where the air is just nice and cool and crisp and it'd be wonderful. 
So I've talked a couple different times about how I live in Alaska, and one other quick story about that is that I live in a town by the ocean, which most of the towns in Alaska are, by the way. Uh, but anyways, I live next to the ocean, but the air is not humid, actually. It's very dry, and so it's not, and it's very crisp and cool, and I don't even know how to explain it. It just feels nice. And like, there's no smog, there's nothing like that. The air is just very, very clean. And maybe you notice this if you live in a city and then you go out in the countryside and it just feels nicer, but I don't know how to explain, like, Alaska, the air is so, so clean that it just is such a stark contrast. It's very noticeable whenever I travel somewhere. Like, I just take it for granted. I'm just around it all the time, so I don't really notice, but it's very noticeable when I go somewhere else. And especially if I, like, I went to uh, Texas, for example, the air is so humid there. It's just, like, oppressively humid. <laughs> and then I come back to Alaska and it's like, you get off the plane and you're like... I don't know how to explain it, it just feels good. It's just very nice. It's kind of one of those things where you, like, don't realize what you have until you lose it kind of thing, sort of, or, like, I don't know, yeah. So I know exactly what Gold is talking about, so for those of you who have not ever had that experience, I just want to express that it is definitely a thing, and uh, I can attest to that. And for those of you watching this who are accustomed to living in a sauna and prefer that, like, more power to you, I firmly believe in that, whatever, just, uh, just know that it's not my preference personally, but that's fine, like, to each their own, and, like, uh, I realize there's probably some people in the comments that are going to be like, Texas Pride! <laughs> Death to the heathen. I guess that's kind of something interesting to idly wonder about. Is there people out there that, like, prefer humid air? Like, uh, I mean, I know there's people that just live there or, like, have grown up there or whatever, and they're just used to it, and it's whatever. But I've never, I don't know that I've ever heard of somebody preferring humid environments. Um, like... Like, I know, um, for example, in southeast in Alaska, that's all rainforest. Alaska's huge, by the way. There's five different climate zones in Alaska, which is crazy. It's, like, totally different. Um, anyways, in southeast, it's all rainforest, so it's all totally different. Like, it rains all the time. There's totally different plants and stuff there because it's a completely different environment, totally different climate. Um, but I've never actually been there. My brother has, though. Uh, but yeah, like, very, very humid there. The air is different, even though it's the same state. So after speaking with Gold, you can then take him to the sky, return to Pumpkin Landing, and we'll drop him off, and he'll have, after a quick conversation, he realizes that apparently you're trying to sick him on digging holes, which is not what he signed up for, so he's a little bit annoyed at this. However, after Kina bats her eyes at him a little bit, he gets all excited because he thinks she's cute, and he's ready to go to town on working on the pumpkin patch. Sucker! And actually, this does bring up an interesting point, because I bet you didn't know, think about this fact, but... We actually have magma mitts. That's right. We are actually capable of completing this very same side quest ourselves. And luckily, Kina did not notice that. So we really dodged a bullet on that one. Or an arrow. There aren't really bullets in Zelda. So uh, I guess we just dodged the arrow anyways. Or the cannonball. Projectile averted. Either way. Oh, yeah. So Kina is super excited to be getting out of all that work, so she will then turn to you and give you five gratitude crystals, and she's just so happy to get out of doing all that work. So, if you've been following along with me, this should be your final patch of gratitude crystals, which brings us up to 80. So we now have all of the gratitude crystals in the entire game. So if you are missing some and you don't know where they are, I recommend that you check out the Gratitude Crystal side quest. I have a page for that that I made that's really fancy that has maps and stuff on the Zelda Dungeon website. And I also have a video of all of the Gratitude Crystals as well. So that is um, that is on the Zelda Dungeon YouTube channel. And I'll have links to both of those in the description. If you like, you can also stick around to get some optional conversation with Kina and Gold and they say humorous things. In particular, Gold, if you speak with him at night. So I'll show those clips right now. So once you're done playing around, you want to hop on your loft wing and return to Skyloft. Now, I haven't actually been back to Bactro in a little while, so I'm actually going to be getting the prizes for 70 Gratitude Crystals as well as 80 at the same time. So, as I just explained a moment ago, we do have all of the Gratitude Crystals in the entire game, so now I'm going to be finishing up all of the Bactro side quests. So at this point in the game, I haven't been back to Batro in a little while, so I'm getting the prize for 70, which is two gold rupees. Now, you should have more than enough room to hold this. Like, honestly, at this point in the game, if you've been getting the extra wallets in Beetle Shop and getting the upgrades from Beetle, then at this point, you should be able to hold, I believe it's 6,900 rupees, which is a lot. So if you are completely full on that, that's... Or if you're full on rupees, so you're wasting these potential gold rupees, I find that unlikely. But it is possible, I suppose, so if anybody really cares and you want to spend it on something else, then you could go do that. I suppose actually one good use for that would be to buy 
uh, treasure from the Moonlight Merchant, and I'll explain more about that towards the end of the game. But anyways, just as a comment, that just in case you are worried about wasting these gold rupees. But yeah, that would be the thing. You'd have to be at your limit, which is 6,900 rupees, which is crazy. The prize for AD Gratitude Crystals is the Tycoon Wallet, which increases our capacity by another 4,000. In total, that brings up our total rupee capacity to 9,900. It's over 9,000! Why would anybody need that much? <laughs> At this point, rupees are kind of pointless, though. I'm not really sure what you would even do with that. Although you could buy treasure from the Moonlight Merchant, so there's that. So I'll sh explain more about that later in the game. We just don't quite have that access to that just yet. For now, though, enjoy this cutscene of Batro getting his wish and finally transforming into a human. <laughs> doesn't really look that different at all. In fact, he looks the exact same, but whatever, as long as he's happy. So as you leave, though, if you, after you complete, I believe it's the sand ship, and you get the second flame, which is Nehru's flame, I want to say. So after you get Nehru's flame, this will upgrade your sword to allow you to douse for more targets. And the next time you go speak with Batro, you will then, as you're leaving his house, you will then get the ability to douse for individual gratitude crystals, which is awesome. However, at this point, I just, of course, literally just handed in all of the gratitude crystals in the game, so there's no reason for me to be able to douse for them. In fact, dousing for them does nothing for me now, but it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, whatever. You know, it's fine, you know, I'm, I'm face palming it by, but it's okay, you know, life is good, you know. Just, uh, we're just gonna douse for gratitude crystals for fun, because we can. You know, life goals and all that. So from now on, you can find Instructor Horwell outside at night, along with Mia, who is the headmaster's cat who was acting all evil and stuff like that, so he'd let her out, unfortunately, regrettably, and, uh, he couldn't get close to her, but now he's apparently able to do so because she's all happy and cute and stuff all the time, which is wonderful. If you speak with Horwell, he will also explain that all the other remlets in town are also not evil, and all of the enemies that were in Skyloft are no longer here. So what I'm getting out of this is that if you really want to defeat monsters, if you really want to put a stop to them for good and defeat them all forever, the solution is not actually to kill them, it is to complete side quests helping people. Because you think violence is the answer? Oh no, my friend. Because the reality is that friendship is magic. So from now on, you can see Batro out here at night on this bridge, and he expresses the same opinion that Horwell did, but he's making the connection that it's with himself. The fact that he's no longer a demon means that the monsters are no longer drawn to Skyloft. I'm not entirely sure if they were just, like, attracted to it and they just appeared, or if, like, his soul or whatever was like a miasma that soaked into things like the remlets for example how it made them evil at night and so maybe that's what happened with all the monsters maybe they're actually like bugs you know horned rhino beetles or sky stag beetles and blessed butterflies and stuff like that and they turned into keys and chews and whatever just kind of a creepy thought but you know it's like that air quality thing i was talking about earlier you know it's like being around bachelor is really bad air quality that is some serious bo like no wonder everyone's afraid of him right in all seriousness though that is kind of an interesting explanation for why they're are enemies in the Zelda series. Like, they often show that in the credits, like, after you defeat the big boss, whoever the boss is, whether it's Ganondorf or somebody else or whatever, that uh, the enemies all disappear and the land of Hyrule is actually all peaceful again. So it's kind of an interesting theory as to why that is. So apparently the very presence of a demon causes other demons to appear or something. It's an interesting theory, and it's kind of cool, like, I, again, like, just, just another example of Skyward Sword having just really gave us a whole lot of little, like, tidbits about the lore of how the world of Zelda works. It's kind of interesting, little things like that. If you're paying attention, there's actually a lot of little details like that that you learn by playing this game. The last thing I wanted to show is that if you go to the bazaar during the day, from now on you can see Batro here hanging out with the residents of Skyloft, and he is super excited to be able to make friends with everyone. So that's very nice and stuff, and whenever you talk with him now, he thanks you once again from the bottom of his heart. So that's all wonderful, and one thing I want to note back here is that behind him there is actually some more stalls that are covered up in cloth and stuff. I wonder if originally the developers were going to have more shops, which is kind of interesting. Anyways, that's the end of this video, folks. Thank you so much for watching. As always, you guys have an amazing day, and I will see you next time.
Per perlers. Um, I'm not sure what those are. Oh, okay. Right. Who was it? There's somebody on ZD who does that a lot. Makes Pokemon. I think it's... They make Pokemon all the time. Oh, man. <laughs> I remember I did that in one of my... Uh, one of my comments, or on YouTube, somebody asked me a question, and it, it made me think of, I don't even know why, just the way he phrased it made, reminded me of a YouTube video I had watched, and how the video starts is that, I'm like, hey Timmy, what's wrong? Did you ask that maid for some crystal water and he told you to suck on a torn hoof? Well, have I got good news for you, Timmy? And so, I don't even know why, like the way he said it, whatever it was he said, reminded me of this YouTube video. So I was like, well, hey Timmy, you know, in the comment, <laughs> and I just said stuff like that. Have I got a deal for you? Head over to this website and click on this link right about there. <laughs> It'll take you exactly where you want to go. No need to thank me. <laughs> I'm here for you. You know, I'm here for dot 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 you exclamation point or whatever. <laughs> so he replied. He's like, wow, thanks. That was super helpful. He's like, by the way, how did you know my name? I'm like, I, I don't know. I was just being weird. Like, did you're are you like, I think I, I think you're trolling me. I don't I don't trust this. You know, <laughs> he's like, no, really, that's my name. I'm like. Yeah, okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> I have no idea who you are, dude. He's like, no, that's really my name. He's like, that's that's crazy. He's like, how'd you guess? I don't know. But that's what I always think of when people talk about the, you know, internet coincidences like that. I'm like, how did you know?